welcome everyone and thanks for joining us at such um, short notice tonight for a meeting regarding the um, COVID outbreak in residential aged care in Orange. I'd like to start tonight's meeting by acknowledging the lands that we're meeting on as a Rudgery land. We're committed to working in the spirit of partnership and collaboration with our region's Aboriginal communities and peoples to improve their health, emotional and social well-being. I warmly welcome Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians who are present in the meeting with us tonight. Just a little bit of housekeeping. If you could put your full name into the chat box um, when you log in and mute yourself unless you've got a question. If you could use the raise your hand function, it just makes it easier to field questions. Um, alternatively, you can use the chat box and type your questions in. Tonight's speakers, we've got Dr. Mel Berry, covering an overview, overview of the RACF situation, the role of um, COVID care in the community service and GPs with RACF outbreaks and treatment with Citrovimab. We've got Dr. Louis Christie, who will be providing an overview of the palliative care management of COVID-19 patients, and Dr. Ivy Chua, who will be providing a lived experience providing GP care to COVID positive residential aged care residents. So I think I'm handing over to Mel to start tonight. Thanks, Liz. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us all here together at a very late stage. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick brief overview of what's happening uh, in the week leading up to Christmas, which couldn't be a better time for everyone. Um, so there are five residents in uh, Gosling Creek that are currently COVID positive. Um, unfortunately, one of them is now deceased. There are also eight staff members in the Gosling Creek outbreak currently, and there has been a significant transmission event. Um, so I do think that there are going to be more patients and staff members that will be affected by this outbreak. Um, we don't know if this is Omicron or Delta, and we are trying to get that um, information if we can. Um, uh, we've just got the Gosling Creek um, uh, manager is just about to join online as well, so they might be able to give us some extra information. I just wanted to touch base with everyone. Obviously, leading up to Christmas, people having different plans, but obviously many of you would have patients within this nursing home. Unfortunately, there also is um, staff members live with other staff members in other parts of nursing homes in other parts of Orange. So it's possible, not definite, but possible that there may be an outbreak in another nursing home. And I guess we're just waiting to see if other staff members go positive. Um, so what I wanted to just say is just a, a quick overview of what COVID care does. So obviously in, in the nursing home space, we don't have a, a big role. And we understand that the GPs do all the care and that's absolutely fine. All COVID care can do is provide extra support if needed. For example, if a GP um, is unable to care for a patient or for example, if a patient doesn't actually have an active GP, which would be unlikely. Um, and also we can facilitate movement of patients between the, the RAC service and, and the hospital. Now, as you can imagine, um, quite a big transmission event in Gosling Creek could put an enormous amount of pressure on the LHD service. Um, and so what we want to try and do is the best care for patients, but also like want to manage the best and do the best we can for patients knowing um, what their care needs are and also sort of being ahead of it and understanding how we can help them. So the other thing that we can do is we can facilitate the use of monoclonal antibodies. Um, so monoclonal antibodies, as you know, can be given to patients who are immunocompromised or have significant comorbidities. Um, and even if people are double vaccinated, if they've got very significant comorbidities or significant immunosuppression, we would still consider those immuno um, monoclonal antibodies, but you do need to give them within a specific time frame, so within five to seven days of onset of symptoms. Um, so we just wanted to flag that up because that's something that we can facilitate, but we only know about people that would need this treatment if that's um, flagged up to us. So that is essentially where we are. Um, the CCIC works between 8 and 10 currently, 8 a.m. in the morning to 10 p.m. at night, and we have GPs, um, some of which who are working today, 
um, or, or people here that have already worked with us that review patients mostly in their home. Um, and we've been reviewing moderate and high level care patients um, in for COVID um, because low care patients now have been transitioned to a self-care model and that started on Friday. I can imagine um, as GPs that you are being inundated from all sides. Um, and this is probably not good news, as it is not good news for me as an emergency physician. We're certainly seeing a lot of people just turning up, not knowing what to do, um, being COVID positive. Um, some of them need help um, and care. Some of them need reassurance. And I can imagine you guys are in the same amount of pressures. Um, really, this is an opportunity just to discuss. Um, we've also got Phil Butler here. Um, who's going to be on for Gen Men, obviously is a geriatrician and can offer any insights. Um, and Ivy will offer, offer what happened in Dubbo um, when they had an outbreak in their nursing home. Um, that's really it for me. I haven't prepared much. I just wanted to sort of start with open with that. And then I think we should move on. I think this really should be a question and answer session as much as we can. Thanks, Al. Um, do we have Louis with us? I can see Louis there. Hi, Louis. Welcome. And thank you for joining at short notice. Oh, it's um, OK. Just give you a little bit of background with um, we, we actually had um, a virtually identical meeting to this in Dubbo when we had our um, aged care facility outbreaks and um, the beautiful CCIC people and Louis similarly joined us at short notice so that we could get everybody on the same page um, and, and with GPs included. And um, Louis is going to talk tonight to um, give us a bit of a flavour of COVID care in the palliative care setting, um, the discussions with families, medication management, etc. Pass on to you, Louis. Oh, thank you. Um yeah, again, I suppose uh, we've now been doing this for a while uh, in various ways, shapes and forms. So we've we, we're a bit more uh, a bit more familiar with it than we used to be. Um, the principles remain pretty much the same. Uh, and so there's not a lot of high tech medicine to get excited about from a palliative care point of view. Uh, it's really the main thing is really about making sure that we've got very clear understandings of plans and a clear understanding of expectations and what's likely to happen uh, and that we're communicating that well to families and patients um, ahead of time. So one of the few things that COVID gives us, um, one of the few rules that it does play by is that people tend to uh, become symptomatic somewhere around the five to seven day mark before they then become seriously unwell. So there's a lead in time uh, between when someone is first identified as, as being uh, affected and when they are likely to physiologically unravel. Uh, and so there's an opportunity for us therefore to make some clear decisions about who's likely to unravel and what we would do in those circumstances. The medicine is very, very straightforward. Um, the only difference really around COVID and palliation is that the global experience is that when people do become extremely unwell and we're looking at managing people in extremis um, as they are dying from COVID, if we're not getting them onto ventilators and trying to keep them alive, um, then it's a relatively rapid decline when it happens. But often there are very high doses of medication required to keep people comfortable. Uh, so for reasons that last time I looked, no one had particularly teased out. These people will often require very high doses of benzodiazepines or of opioids or of both in order to remain comfortable and settled uh, as, they're, as they're dying. Um, so the, there are some guidelines that have been out that I think Ivy was going to send through to everyone. They haven't changed uh, in the palliative space. Uh, so it's around being a, being 
prepared uh, from the point of view of prescribing, making sure the medications available, remembering that the nursing homes don't hold large stocks of opioids and benzodiazepines, midazolam and so forth uh, on spec, uh, that if we want to have that available, we've got they've got to have scripts and they've got to have it charted ahead of time, uh, but you all know that. Um, so it's around making sure that there's adequate medications well ahead of time before people unravel. Uh, and then that there is a clear understanding amongst staff and amongst family and, and the residents themselves around what that might look like and how we might manage it. Um, so the, the, the concern about opioid use, um, the WHO would still say, if you're in doubt, just go to morphine as your first line thing and then ask around. Um, definitely the guidelines that we've put out talk primarily about morphine as the opioid of choice uh, use, and essentially that reflects um, the availability of opioids uh, in our part of the world and the fact that particularly in a lot of the smaller sites, a lot of the smaller centres, getting hold of more, uh, getting hold of hydromorphone and things like that can be very, very difficult. Um, so opioid selection is pretty much straight, the, the same as you would, uh, follows the same sort of lines that would, you would usually use. You would just tend to have um, an awareness that people may reach a point very rapidly of not being able to swallow, and so the oral route may only be effective for a short period of time, and that the doses that we need uh, may need to be escalated reasonably quickly if people aren't getting good control with small doses. Uh, and similarly with benzodiazepines, and, and in reality, the, the benzo that we're going to use most is midazolam. Um, so the medicine is fairly straightforward. There's not a lot of tricky drugs from a palliative care point of view, uh, and there's a, and there's not a lot of uh, technical sort of know-how around the prescribing. Um, it's just about making sure people are comfortable and using sufficient medication to keep people comfortable. The complexity comes around that process of engaging people in discussions that they haven't previously had. Uh, so often, you know, as you know, people will come into an aged care facility and they will have some sort of end of life care discussion. Um, and the, the depth and of those and the recollection around patients and families of what might have been discussed varies enormously. Uh, and they may have happened some time before. If the person's been resident in a nursing home for three or four years, uh, it may be that their advanced care directive uh, was completed in whatever manner when they first arrived and that they haven't had a, a thought about that or they haven't really looked back at that since they've been in. So that window that we have between people becoming infected uh, and people crashing uh, is the opportunity that we have to seriously look at the advanced care planning documentation and get a clear understanding of patients and their relatives around what's likely to be beneficial and what's not. Um, and there's uh, obviously from uh, the community in care in the in uh, sorry COVID care in the community team there's also the and f through Phil there's also the advice the opportunity for advice to look at individual cases and start to make some determinations about who may do well uh, and who is unlikely to do well in these scenarios uh, and then we need to be communicating that early one of the things that often happens with advanced care planning discussions when people have them uh, as they're coming into nursing homes or, or in a general sort of sense is that the the conversation is a theoretical conversation framed around what would you like us to do if dot 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 uh, so we're asking people to imagine a hypothetical scenario uh, what would you like us to do if you got unwell and often what will come back from that unless we're very careful in how we lead it is you know people telling us and we've had these in the last 12 months, um, that they'd be up for a bit of intubation, but they don't think they'd like CPR, and they'd be up for a bit of this, but they don't think they'd like a bit of that, and perhaps they'd like inotropes because that sounds exciting, but you know they don't really think they'd like antibiotics. Or you know we get, we get jumbled messages. So there are two differences. The first one is that uh, we need to make sure that any plans that are in place are clear and make sense. And the second one is that we will reach a point for the, many of these people when we decide to palliate them, where it's no longer a question of, of what would you like, it's a question around what is the medicine going to do for you and 
therefore what is a benefit? Um, and so those are often a lot more prescriptive uh, discussions around the fact that what we can tell from someone we, in this situation with these comorbidities um, is that this is not going to go well and ventilation is unlikely. You know, mechanical ventilation and prolonged ICU stays uh, are unlikely to be of any benefit to you and so we're not going to embark on them. And that's a medical decision. It's not about what you want. It's about the situation in which we are. You know, for instance, if we've got someone uh, who has previously been knocked back for an elective anaesthetic to fix a knee because the anaesthetic risk was thought to be too high. This person is not going to survive the three weeks or four weeks on a ventilator that they would need should they need ventilation. Um, so we're just not going to start. Um, and that's the reality of the situation. If they're too unwell for an anaesthetic, they're too unwell to be put on a ventilator for COVID, uh, regardless of how robust they otherwise may be. And so sometimes the discussion comes down to a discussion more around what we are capable of doing and what the medicine can reasonably provide uh, as opposed to a discussion about um, uh, what we might, what we might, you know, what you might like us to do in the event of something going bad. And when we look at experiences around the state and other places, um, where people have had difficulty, it's been along those lines where the communication has been around what would you like? Um, and then people say they'd like something. Uh, and then we have a discussion and decide that actually it doesn't matter whether you like that or not, we're not going to do it. Um, and then there's the distress of having to go back and talk to people about the fact that, well, yes, we did talk about ventilation, but we've now decided that ventilation's off the table, even though you said you wanted it, because that then creates a whole lot of confusion and mixed message for people. Um, so I suppose that's the most important thing really. It's about the clear communication with families and the fact that the conversation may well be a conversation that is very, very different to the ones that they are used to having and very different to the conversations that the staff in the nursing homes are used to engaging in with the residents uh, around their ongoing management. So I suppose I didn't have a slideshow or anything either. Uh, those were the main points that I wanted to get across. Um, and that I think are important for us to think about. So I'll sit back and see if any questions appear or anyone wants to heckle me down. I just want to mention a couple of things that you've pointed out, um, Louis. So firstly, communication is key. So the residents are going to be feeling incredibly anxious, but also the families. So if you ring Gosling Clinic at the moment, it's very difficult to get hold of people because they're so busy. There's many staff furloughed and the staff are stretched. And Joseph, who is on the line, has done an amazing job with their team to get more staff coming in. But they will be staff that are from Sydney that won't know the patient. So if you can imagine as a, a family member, that's very distressing. Also, we're leading into a sort of festival period where people won't be able to see their families, so they are distressed. In terms of the patients from the symptoms, what we've seen, you know, a few weeks ago or a few months ago when we had an outbreak may be different to what we see today because I suspect that this is Omicron. I don't know for sure, but I suspect it is. But certainly when we had a Delta outbreak, there was a predominance, and this is regardless of vaccination, of diarrhea and vomiting and anorexia in our very elderly, frail patients. And the first thing that happens with the patients is they get profound anorexia. And I suspect that that's because they lose their sense of smell and taste. Um, and so a lot of the patients that passed away, um, I think, was from dehydration. Um, so there was a, a few patients that passed away in that outbreak in Dubbo. And I think dehydration was actually the, the predominant feature rather than the shortness of the breath and respiratory distress that you'd see in a younger patient. Certainly as you progress through the illness, then you still will see respiratory distress and hypoxia. And that will be regardless of vaccination. Um, fortunately, a number of these patients are triple vaccinated, so we can hope to see that they've got fairly good cover. But when you're extremely frail, it doesn't actually matter. You're still, you know, as Phil will say to you, for, to me, even if you um, get a cold and you're extremely frail, then that could be your, the end of life for you. Other things you'll see is um, obviously delirium because it's like any other viral illness, it will precipitate. Other things you'll see is that um, elderly patients in the racks are going to get other things such as urinary tract infections, 
um, and the usual things that people get from a uh, nursing home. Um, and we did have a couple of falls. So that's just something else to think about. How do you manage that patient when they have a fall? And it's just important that we can probably help um, move that transit, that patient in and out of the hospital more seamlessly so that there's not risk of transmission. As long as we know that that patient's coming, we can do a bit of work so that we can optimise getting the getting the x-rays, finding out what we're going to do, that, that kind of thing. Thanks. Thanks, Louis. Thanks, Nell. Um, I'll just do a quick run through of the experience with the aged care facility outbreaks in Dubbo. Um, I'll share my slides, um, but I want to have a decent amount of time for a two-way discussion with attendees, so I'll talk quickly. I never quite know how to do this nicely um, on this sort of screen, so I'll just show you this sort of view, if that's OK with everyone. So um, just a handful of slides there, but um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a GP at Double Family Doctors, um, but been doing a lot of COVID related um, things over the last uh, year and a half or nearly two years now. Um, but a lot of the content of what I'm going to talk about is um, with uh, acknowledgements to uh, the rest of the GPs in Dubbo as well, um, who all banded together to look after our RAC patients um, with our two outbreaks and uh, the CCIC team and staff, of course, at those nursing homes. Um, but also um, a really excellent webinar I was part of um, presented uh, by Melbourne geriatricians and GPs and ID physicians um, just a month ago. Um, so moving on, actually, let me see. Will this work if I show that? Can people see the slide presentation or is it just the... Yeah, we can see it. Can yeah. see it? Terrific. So um, the outbreaks in the aged care facilities back in 2020, um, the mortality rates hit something like a third of the residents and those were the horrible reports we were getting through the news all the time about aged care facility residents passing away. Um, in 2021, mortality, mortality rates are more like 10%. Um, and you would think vaccinations form the major part of that. Um, so we're in much better position now than we were uh, last year. Um, but it was interesting to hear uh, Dr. Lowe, a geriatrician at Northern Health down in Melbourne, who said uh, for for him, he felt that the last year the major failings that GPs were kept out of the loop um, in providing care at their aged care facility outbreaks. And so they evolved their um, current model where it's a very collaborative care model um, with GPs predominantly doing telehealth consultations, um, the very rare face-to-face -face visit if required. Um, and it was interesting in Dubbo, we did um, pretty much the same thing without knowing that uh, that's what they developed down south. So in Dubbo, we had our two aged care facility outbreaks um, that started early September and drizzled on into October. Um, it was very much a collaborative approach and I think um, credit to everybody who worked together on this. Um, the patient's usual GPs were involved, um, except for one GP who just due to connectivity issues was the main reason that he uh, felt uh, not able to take part. His, um, his home was on a, uh, quite a distance from town. His um, phone reception um, at home was, was quite poor and so he felt he wouldn't be able to be easily contacted. Um, and so I ended up taking on his patients um, when they when they contracted COVID on his behalf. Um, CCIC nurses and doctors um, were very much in the thick of it all and the aged care facility staff, absolutely. Um, I just talked through some of the things that sort of, um, some of the reflections, I suppose, on the things that worked well. Uh, hopefully those are the things that you guys can adopt. Um, there were some ch very challenging things as well. Um, but the main thing was troubleshooting and communicating and, and making sure that we just problem solved day by day. Um, but some of the really crucial systems, um, of course, the aged care facilities put um, put their residents into red zone and amber zones um, immediately. Um, and so that did mean, though, that uh, we still looked after amber zone patients as well as our red zone patients. 
Um, it was really important that the, the, your Amber Zone patients don't miss out on required care during this period of time. Staffing, staffing, staffing was major in the early days, um, as it looks like is happening at Gosling Creek as well. Um, a lot of the staff were furloughed um, and some of the, the very senior staff were furloughed, which meant that um, we were relying on aged care facility nurses who um, came from out of the region who were amazing in coming in to help out, but they really didn't know the patients. And it meant that the GPs knowing the patients were then absolutely crucial to ensuring that um, things went okay. Um, the, um, the, the, there was also issues with staffing that was you know, outside of uh, nursing staffing, admin staffing, um, kitchen staffing, every staff member, you know, the, all, all of those staffing levels were affected. Um, so have that in mind when you are trying to get things organised. You know, you don't want to be asking um, the poor nurses to be doing OBS every couple of hours when you could be asking them to do OBS once a shift. Communication, as Mel said, was absolutely key and that was pretty disastrous <laughs> in the first few days um, and involved things like we just had to make sure that the nurses in the red zone and the nurses in the uh, amber zones, that we had separate um, mobile contact numbers for them. Um, very early on, we gathered um, mobile phone numbers and email addresses um, for each uh, GP involved in care. Um, and so that sat separately from our usual um, contact uh, arrangements and, and models of care. Um, so all of our GPs had agreed that we'd made our uh, mobile phone numbers available um, for to be and, and to be available 24 7 if required for these patients interestingly we very rarely needed to be called um outside of usual working hours um and i think and i'll talk to this in a minute so it was probably the system of how you know the world rounds worked in the morning and then ended up being that gps would then um be contacted sort of later on in the morning to discuss any issues that would have come up um, but we also needed to know um, the email addresses of pharmacists because you know, by the time we were trying to do all this via telehealth, um, you know, a lot of our scripts and things ended up having to be emailed. Right now we can actually do the e-scripts directly to, to pharmacists in, with some pharmacies, so that's much easier. Um, but certainly at that time uh, we, were, we were just emailing charts and scripts left, right and centre. Um, not completely as per the RACGP standards, but hey, it was a crisis and you just got to get by. Um, from the logistical communication perspective, we created a WhatsApp group so that we had our GPs, we had um, Mel, we had um, palliative care nursing, aged care nurses um, involved in that group as well. And, and that didn't have any, you know, clinical patient um it wasn't sort of patient discussion on that. It was um, very much around, oh, hey, guys, you know, here's a phone number of the of the red zone nurse today. And, um, you know, here's the, the email address for this pharmacist. Um, hey, we're meeting up at lunchtime today. Here's the Zoom link for the meeting. Um, so it's just that logistical discussion would, would happen via that WhatsApp group. Um, morning virtual ward rounds happened um, involving the red zone nurses. A CCIC nurse um, and then one of us GPs um, and that was really just to ensure that there was that a um, little bit of you know additional support from the medical perspective that meant that you know the, the whole bunch of things didn't need to be escalated um, to the other GPs um, but you know a lot of things that were you know directly about that patient only um, that would definitely get escalated to the patient's usual GP and, and continuity of care uh, fostered. We also had lunchtime case discussions and, and those are really important um, for everybody's learning. I mean, looking after COVID and especially looking after COVID in an aged care setting was new to um, all of us. And so um, having the GPs brainstorming together with CCIC doctor each day, um, the CCIC nurse, uh, the, the aged care facility resident nurses, but we also had a palliative care nurse come and join us too. So what did we actually do from a GP perspective? Um, supportive care was a major part of that, and I'll talk through that in further detail in further slides. Um, medical care, absolutely. Um, medication management, oxygen, fluids, palliative care. Um, but really importantly, it was our knowledge of our patients. So 
you know, if you, you know, the fact that you know that um, somebody needs to be on thickened fluids um, when it's a, a, a nurse who's flown in from Melbourne to look after this patient um, and nobody else knows about this patient needing thickened fluids and the, and the patient themselves can't um, can't convey that information. Those little things, but so very crucial. Um, even knowing if this patient is normally confused, normally boisterous, uh, normally drowsy, normally bed bound, all of those things ended up being really important in knowing whether that patient was stable or deteriorating. But knowledge of families was super important as well. Um, you know, having that discussion with families when you know them already, um, it, it just made it a lot easier um, compared to having a, a discussion with somebody who is completely sort of an alien to you and, and you to them. Um, support for nursing staff. And look, you know, our, our aged care nurses are fantastic and, and threw themselves into um, providing the care. But gosh, it's a, it's a hard slog, you know, turning up in the morning, full PPE all day um, and and, you know, being worried about the patients who they've been looking after for a long time. Um, so, you know, supporting them um, in their roles is important, um, but also encouraging them to do just really good basic nursing care. And as Mel said, um, one of the big, big learnings from our Dubbo experience was we just needed to get fluids into these people. Um, we recognised as time went on that really taste and, and smell just went out the window for a lot of our patients and it may, may be different if Omicron's on the scene or not, I don't know, um, but definitely watch out for that um, and push those fluids and push them early. Um, virtually all of the care was provided via video and phone consultations directly with patients, um, a lot of discussions with the nursing staff themselves um, and sometimes without the patients, um, but that was, you know, 99% of the care. Um, between us, we did have three days where um, Chantelle, one of our other GPs, um, she had provided face-to-face -face visits um, on one of those days. So basically all of our GPs went, right, can you look at this patient for me? Chantelle went in and did that on a, I think it was like a, a Tuesday and a Wednesday and I did it on, on the Thursday and that was about it because after that you know things were going okay we'd sort of gotten into a groove we knew what we we're doing um, uh, but th those face-to-face -face visits are really so important for our aged care nurses in terms of and they were doing a great job anyway um, but being able to just physically go in and go right I'll sort out all of the med charts in one hit um, and you know that, that, that they're on track um, it was helpful with a couple of residents where I recall one resident where, you know, being able to listen into the chest and go, oh, look, that's unilateral crackles there. Um, I think that person's got a secondary bacterial infection or, or a coexisting bacterial infection. Um, and maybe that's why they're going downhill and let's pop them on some amoxicillin as well. Um, and then, of course, escalating care. So, you know, the nursing staff are very good at working through, um, particularly with the CCIC nurse support, uh, working through um, the, the symptoms and signs that uh, uh, give give an idea of the patient's um, condition is deteriorating. Um, but certainly um, the GPs then liaising with the hospital team, um, but often by the CCIC team to escalate care, um, that was important. A little bit about supportive care. Um, so, yep, poor oral intake and just do the basics, you know, what we normally do when we're looking after our patients. Um, remember to check the meds, stop the diuretics, withhold them, reduce them, whatever as required. Um, think about the diabetic meds as well. Um, push fluids, uh, gastrolyte, um, consider subcut fluids. We ended up doing that for a couple of residents um, and that sort of saved them from having to to uh, turn the corner and, and, and from going to hospital. Um, look at drowsiness again, just check the meds. Is there anything you can do with that? Um, oral intake diary, uh, hydrolytes, great. Hope there's lots of that in stock. Um, treatment for the cough to help out if need be. Um, confusion, and this is just the usual, you know, treat this is this is this is a 
an infective illness and just go, oh gosh, you know, um, that's there. But the the usual um, aged care stuff that we're used to doing as well, you know, what else is it that might be causing the confusion? A um, few UTIs we treated along the way uh, during that period of time, certainly constipation as well. And wandering patients were interesting. One aged care facility had all their patients in a huge, what they turned into a huge, huge ward. So that was easy in the sense of that those patients could just continue wandering around within that red zone and that was fine. But the other facility had separate individual rooms and each patient was sort of closed off in their own individual room and um, wandering was, was more challenging to, to sort out, um, but needing to think laterally to keep those patients occupied um, so that they would stay in their rooms as much as possible. A few things about medication management. Um, remember to convert nebulizers to MDI in the space. So it's, you, know, you don't want to be um, nebulizing good old COVID virus into the air. Um, Budesonide's there as an available medication that's been shown in a fairly small trial, but um, certainly there on the, the recommended list for aged care uh, residents with COVID. Um, if needed, um, and that's a fairly, yeah, 800 mics BD, 4 to 14 days. Um, for the residents who are requiring oxygen therapy, um, I think we ended up having a couple of patients who were popped onto dexamethasone, um, six milligrams. Um, and what we did learn um, was that you, did, you, you just stopped it as soon as they, they started to get better. Um, so, yeah, um, it's there and it certainly seemed to make a difference for those couple of patients um, with that dexamethasone on board. Um, you know, we, we um denied because, you know, we'd heard about, gosh, you know, was, was it likely to cause um, more problems than, than um, be a good thing for the patient in terms of confusion, insomnia, fluid retention, etc. Um, but our N equals two um, worked okay. Uh, monitor the BSLs, of course. Um, think about um, bacterial co-infection, um, especially if they've got um, chest cough, unilateral chest findings early in the illness. Um, amoxicillin cylinders at the go if they're not allergic to it. Um, there, there's questions about using um, DVT prophylaxis, and you know you got to balance this up with everything else for that patient and what the goals of care are. Um, and certainly, um, yeah, it's it's an option. Um, I don't think we ended up using it at all um, in our double outbreaks, but it was certainly there um, and used fairly frequently in the um, Melbourne outbreaks when those geriatricians were describing their care that they provided with the GPs. And palliative care um, meds. Um, as Louis said, um, yeah, we, we absolutely ended up using really mega opioid doses. And, you know, I've, I've worked at Lord's Hospital in, in palliative care, um, but it was really rapidly escalating doses. You know, you chart somebody up for their, their two hourly PRN um, opioids, and the next day you're charting up for a mega dose of opioids to go into to a 24 hour syringe driver. Um, and, and that's okay if it's needed um, and go, go for it. Um, it really important thing to, to do the anticipatory charting of palliative care meds so that you're pre-charting it. Um, and that ended up working really well. But if you put really clear indications what each drug is to be used for, um, there was, I think one of the nurses had some concerns about, um, you know, it, yeah, that, that she would be causing harm to the patient, um, but really that need, that patient needed comfort care um, and required us to, to have a conversation around um, supporting her with that. Discussion with families, big thing. Um, and um, this I'm gonna credit to um, a, a geriatrician called Andrea down in Melbourne, um, just be able to explain to patients that, that you know, and families that it's common to lose taste and smell that um, they're going to be tired. And in fact, all of our patients got really mega tired with our aged care facilities um, and they're likely to need prompting with fluids. Um, but the majority will actually do, if they're vaccinated, will actually do quite well with supportive care. Um, and we found that if they sort of got past that, that first week or so and they were still up and bouncy and bubbly, um, they just seemed to ride out the rest of the 
the time just fine. Um, but also, I guess, be realistic and explain to families that 10% can get more severe COVID um, and that it can be fatal and so that they've still got that um, possibility at the back of their minds. Um, um, reassure them that at the aged care facilities, you know, care can be provided. And this is really different to, you know, providing care for the, a patient at home versus an aged care facility because they do have the nurses there, um, you know, the oxygen levels are being monitored each shift, the blood pressures, um, respiratory rates, temps, um, and, and also their intake. Um, so that, that, that there's nursing care that that's provided and make sure that the families are aware of that. Um, and so that in that case, you know, the, the care will be similar to what the hospital can provide. And really beyond that, um, I guess, you know, it'd be a discussion with a CCIC team if you thought that um, going into hospital for a patient um, with, for, you know, for in relation to the COVID um, in particular might be of benefit. Um, what we did find was that the people who ended up going to hospital, we went into hospital for other things that weren't sort of directly COVID related, but were just... Um, um, an additional thing that might have happened, like like falls and things um, as well. Um, and regular updates, our nursing home staff ended up um, contacting patients' families on a daily basis to provide them regular updates, and, and I think that provided an immense amount of reassurance. I've put question mark for compassionate visits because um, that may be an option, um, but I, I guess we, we had our... Um, we had one gentleman come in to say goodbye to his wife um, and, and you know, he was decked out in, in full PPE, um, but uh, as he went into his room, he needed to give his wife a goodbye kiss and removed his PPE in order to do that. Um, and so he was sent into, into isolation after that. Um, and I guess, uh, um, yeah, that, that may, may be an option um, if required. And I'll stop talking there. Anybody's um, anybody got questions? Just um, just one thing from the current outbreak is they definitely and we don't know if these patients that are sick were um, very frail to begin with, but they definitely are showing earlier signs of hypoxia and less diarrhea and vomiting. So the three patients that are currently sick are all quite profoundly hypoxic. Already mm. in the eighty six percent and. Um, all on oxygen at the moment. Okay, um, we'd love to hear questions. Um, and I think we'd really, Phil, I know has to go, um, but we really do also wanna talk about what happens when this becomes 10 or 20 patients, um, because I think that does really impact on how we're gonna look at this as a sort of almost an external disaster to the hospital and whether we take a team to actually go and do a ward round or, you know, we, I think we need to, as a group, um, work, workshop that a little bit particularly if we had like multiple outbreaks in multiple racks. Um, Phil, did you want to add anything? Just because I do know you have to go. Oh, hi, everyone. I'll just add that I think this is it's safe to say that this is really uncharted territory and that each wave of COVID is interacted with frail older people in aged care facilities differently because of, you know, the presence or absence of vaccination and different strains. And I think, Mel, you mentioned that we don't know yet whether this is Omicron or Delta. And for that reason, things like expected rates of severe disease in a, in a, in a vaccinated population, we just don't know. And we're really going to be all learning together on the fly. I haven't personally on the ground looked after any um, COVID patients in aged care facilities, but along with my general medicine colleagues, we have in hospital. And I, I think the, the rule along the way has been that it, it's often quite difficult to work out what the right thing to do um, in terms of specific management decisions for individual patients. And we've generally called friends and colleagues along the way to make it, you know seemingly basic decisions like, will we give steroid therapy to this patient or, or not? Are there any advanced therapies in hospital, for example, that this particular patient might benefit from? And the truth is that often no one person really knows the answer and it's something we have to work out together. So I'd um, encourage those of you who in weeks or hopefully not months to come are looking after um, aged care facility residents with COVID that you 
um, talk to each other. Um, those of your colleagues in the GP community who have some experience working in this field and also use the COVID care and the community teams um, huge experience in the last six to nine months and also um, the you know, on-call physician at um, Orange Base Hospital. So for the next week, that'll be me. I'm just taking over from Nani Yakara, and then there'll be a seri series of us being on call for a week at a time after that. And you know, we we're, we'll be here to support the COVID care and the community team and to discuss um, patients coming into hospital, but also happy to be happy to discuss the pros and cons of specific management decisions for people who are, are going to stay in the aged care facility for their admission. Any questions, any comments? Mel, you'd, um, you'd popped in the chat about fit testing. Um, Sonia, did you want to provide an update on that? Sorry. Thanks, Ivy. Um, yeah, the PHN is just continue. We're just investigating the options with that. Um, we've looked at uh, a few different companies and got some quotes. It's very expensive, um, but we're also looking at an opportunity uh, where we might be able to actually purchase a machine and upskill staff so that it's ongoing and we can then do that ongoing. So we're still just working that out. So thanks. Thanks, Sonia. And and I guess in a, as an interim measure until that gets sorted out, um, um, we kind of snuck into um, with with Mel's support um, with the infection control people. Um, we kind of snuck in a couple of our GPs to get fit tested. Um, so I'd, I'd say yeah, don't don't be going into the aged care facility without um, proper fit testing. Um, really important that that gets done. Uh, hi, it's Peter. Um, I'm one of the uh, um, uh, staff members for RIT, uh, supporting the home with uh, Gosling Creek with uh, COVID outbreak management. My, my question is around um, uh, fluids hydration for residents. For those family members who are a little bit apprehensive about sending someone to hospital and where the resident is not eating or drinking well, whether there is uh, any, uh, whether it's reasonable to consider subcut fluids for such residents. As you know, we can't do IV fluids. We don't have nurses that are competent to do that, but uh, whether a subcut fluid is something that we can consider. Peter, it's Ivy here. We, we did end up using subcut fluids um, with a couple of patients. Um, we, and we had another patient who ended up being sent to hospital for IV fluids, um, but uh, it, it, one of the facilities, um, it, it, to, it wasn't the equipment and although equipment could have been obtained but probably more so the staff skill set at that point in time on that particular day um, weren't able to to put up the subcut fluids but the other facility um, we did we did end up doing subcut fluids for a couple of those patients and we only really needed to do that for that 24 48 hours um, and they kind of turned the corner and started to pick up okay thank you the main point I'll make about subcut fluids is that um, evidence is pretty weak in this field in general. You're limited with the volume you can get in in 24 hours to about a litre. And if somebody's volume depleted to the point where they're, they're hemodynamically unstable, it's not going to do anything. Um, so um, really your, your options there are um, consider end of life care or uh, discuss pros and cons of transfer to hospital with subcut fluids alone won't cut it in that situation. Yeah, and the other question is around um, <clears throat> the oxygen uh, that some residents may require. Uh, the recommended um, doses for oxygen in terms of litres, um, what is the best um, range for those that are desaturating 
And again, we're unable to send them to hospital, whether it's because the family have chosen not to. Well, I think it's for comfort, isn't it? So you yep. can give oxygen. It's not really a measure. Um, you can give as much as the patient is tolerating. Really, it's for comfort more than for the absolute saturation level. It's um, if you've decided that this is for comfort measures, I think, you know, if you're trying to blare someone down with nasal prong oxygen and it's 10 litres, it's really uncomfortable. Um, so I think it's just um, would be determined by the GP how much they want to give and how the patient's tolerating it. I would, I, I note that Peter Holmes is there and he it has a patient currently in Gosling Creek. Did you want to comment on anything about how it's all going? Oh, you're welcome not to, so I'll put you, put you on the spot. Oh, I just have to unmute Pete. Um, maybe you can write in the chat. Um, has anyone else got a patient that's actually in Gosling Creek that wanted to talk about it? And the other thing I really wanted to ask is anyone going away over Christmas, is this going to impact it or does everyone have plans for after hours care? They feel like that's going to be okay. Uh, Ken Hazelton Mel. Um, I think it just depends how many there end up being. I mean, our practice doesn't currently have anyone that I'm aware of. Mm. Um, and there will be a lot of people away, but I mean, we've got our roster. But mm. if there's a lot of um, sick patients, then I guess the on call person is going to feel um, hard done by. So I guess we're going to play it by ear, depending how big the, the outbreak gets. Um, okay, that's good news. And I guess um, we'll just work it out. And I think each practice has a plan, don't they, for their after hours service? Uh, it's uh, David Howe here. I, I, I'm actually the guy on call for Christmas. Um, so I'm just wondering, so is Gosling Creek all set up to do the um, some form of telehealth uh, over um, all their residents? So they have had iPads put into place now. The Philips um, system has been put into place. Um, also, I'll ask Joseph to comment it. So you would be able to be set up to do some telehealth. Um, absolutely. Um, Joseph, did you want to comment any more about Oh, sorry, Peter, did you want to comment about that from the... Yes, the we are. We are set up for, for telehealth. Great. Now, notice that Martin has said that he's got a Gosling pa Creek patient but don't yet know too much about what's happening there. Um, so, Martin, are you there? Are you able to unmute? Did you want to have a quick chat? Um, I wonder if it's been because you um, have not been contacted by the facility or um, I'm interested to hear what um, your concerns are. Um, and if anyone wants to unmute, if you look at the top bar over the top, there's like little icons and the third one from the end is a microphone. If you hit that one, that will unmute it. Um, I'm not sure if Martin. Oh, it's Alan. Um, I can talk. I spoke to Martin about his patient. Um, and he was able to give quite a deal of information that we don't otherwise have access to. Um, 
and I guess it's it's a two way street and an evolving situation. And we find some information uh, and collect and collate and then hopefully be able to feedback at some stage. So um, and I think, Martin, we've agreed that your patient wasn't for any further treatment escalation with um, antibody therapy. Um, but I have no other details since then other than she was comfortable in the So just in regards to antibody therapy, um, I'll send out the brochure um, just to give everyone a reminder about the requirements for the antibody therapy and it just has to happen within five days of one set of treat of uh, symptoms um, and then if you do want to do that we've got a universal number where you can contact the medical leader and then we can create an opportunity for that to occur um, so um, and there's actually a new and a monoclonal antibody combination treatment that's just coming on and we've just had access to five vials of that so that has a slightly longer time that you can use it. Um, so that's seven to 10 days. So if you have, a, either, for example, an unvaccinated patient, um, that certainly would be someone or someone who's got multiple comorbidities or morbid obesity, diabetes, heart failure, um, then we would definitely consider those patients for the monoclonal therapies. Um, and I, so in terms of... Does, is there any other questions that people have or, or does everyone feel quite comfortable and we'll leave it at that today? Mel, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. It's Martin. Thanks, Alan, for what you said. I couldn't get my microphone to work. One of the, I missed the beginning of the this meeting, I'm sorry, but I one thing I'm still trying to work out is how much COVID care in the home cares for the patients and how much their GP, just mm. how that works. Obviously, the communicating is important. Um, essentially, COVID care in the community doesn't do the care unless we're requested to by the GP. So we want to be collaborative, but we don't want to take over. So very much it's a, you know, it's a service that is provided. If, if for example, GP is like, I just, I don't want to do this at the moment, we'll take over care of the patient. Or equally, if you want us to negotiate, like the patient breaks their arm and you want us to try and work out a, a quick and easy way for the, them to get an x-ray, we can do that. Or mm. if you've not seen a lot of patients with COVID and you just want a different, like another headset of, because we've seen, you know, over 2,000 patients with COVID now. So if you just want to talk about something and say, is that normal, we'll provide that support as well. So it can be as much or as little as you want. We have, um, we have a workforce of GPs that can review patients, but that's not what the idea is. It's not to come in and take over. It's actually just to be um, a, a service that is helpful to you. Yeah. So, Alan, can I ask how you got involved? Did the did the nursing home ask you to be involved? Uh, thanks. I'm back on. Yes. No. I, the bus told me. Um, we find out. <laughs> uh, we find out about all the um, positives and try and pick out ones that are either going to cause problems or maybe an eligible for antibody therapy or, you know, like they're pregnant. And with those, try and get as much information as possible. And we often have very limited information. Mm -hmm. So that's why, why we ended up calling you, Martin, of course. Uh, that was specifically relevant to get that back, deeper background for that situation. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I suppose your patient was unvaccinated, Martin, so we wondered if yeah, you wanted to consider citrovimab. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciated that you were involved. Thank you. I was just trying to work out how it all how it all works. How it started. No, it wasn't from the nursing home. It may be come from the nursing home. It may yeah. be come from just people ask questions. Um, a lot of people are watching to see who ticks over, who ticks positive and who might need some help. Um, mm. and, and so that may be passed around. Um, so it may come to you first, it may come to us first. Yeah. But as Mel said, we, we're more than happy to try and be collaborative. But um, I think at this stage, we still need to do the antibody stuff. 
but they let me do it, so I'm sure they'd let you do it. <laughs> <laughs> we we don't want to get in anyone's way at all, and we don't want to take over at all. We just want to be. We just want to make that transition from nursing home to hospital easier. Um, we just found when we started like the journey of doing COVID, like we didn't know anything about it. So it was nice to share that medical mindset with another doctor. So we appreciate that. And we thought, you know, if you want to do that, that's good. And if you don't, that's good too. Mm. Um, yeah, but it, it is purely collaborative. It is not taking over. That is not the aim um, because we have lots of other patients in the community as well. And we all need holidays as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if there is a um a patient in need of hospital care from gosling creek um do, do we just send them over or do we we need to talk to the director of a e or what what's our situation so i think it depends on so it depends on a few things so like obviously if you're transferring a patient over to the hospital because you know they're appropriate for transfer over hospital they'll be see like fairly functional, going to go over the hospital, they're going to have um, intubation, NIV, IV fluids or oxygen, and they need that in a hospital. That would be the first thing to ascertain that. Then next thing is like, is it an emergency? And you just need to call triple zero and get that patient over. And then whilst you're doing the triple zero, then you just call ahead to the emergency department and say, hey, listen up, this patient's COVID positive and they're coming 250 metres across the road. But if it's like actually they're deteriorating, they're starting to get a bit worse. And we did have a patient like this yesterday. And as um, the GP that was looking after that patient was like, that actually this person's quite mm -hmm. functional and would benefit from some oxygen and some fluids and the family really wanted him to go across to the hospital, then it, we can help that transition. So you're very welcome to ring the medical physician on call who's the COVID physician um, or alternatively you can call COVID care and we can like arrange like a conversation with everyone on the on the phone and that just basically gets everyone on the phone because what it can do is it can mean that that patient can be directly transferred from the nursing home straight up into the ward rather than going via ED. As you can imagine ED is pretty inundated at the moment with lots of people coming in who are sick um, but also who are well with COVID um, turning up worried which I'm sure is similar in the GP. Um, so if we can streamline a process, then that's great. But obviously, if the patient's very unwell for needing hospital, then call triple zero and call the ED admitting officer. So, so the the main protocol would be the medical registrar or directly the, to the. No, I would call the consultant. Call the consultant. consultant yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So that will be Phil from tomorrow, um, and then onwards. Yep. The general medicine physician on call. Because I think if you call the registrar, you'll get a, um, oh, you guys know what it's like. Call the registrar, you won't get a firm firm answer. You'll get a, I just need to speak to my boss. No, like this is, uh, you've made the decision, they're coming over, you need to speak to another consultant. You're a consultant, you speak to another consultant. You don't want to have too many intermediaries me messing it up for you. No, th thanks for that. Mm. Okay. All silent. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Ivy, for having us and the Thanks. PhD team. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think um, the, the other thing I just wanted to ask too was um, in terms of um if there's an issue that comes up uh, I don't is there a clear pathway to contacting um patients uh usual gps um, i guess that's and particularly over this upcoming period um be really helpful i would imagine for the nursing staff to know where they stand with that um so if um if yeah if uh, gps could make that known to the aged care facility um what's what's the best way to sort this out um peter um hi um so we we have um a, a number of care managers supporting the um the home and 
they'll be responsible for um, escalating any deteriorating residents of the GP. Uh, but I guess where we've had issues yesterday, we've, we've been able to be in touch with the uh, uh, with the Orange Base Hospital, and we did receive some advice around uh, how we'd be transporting a resident to uh, um, to a COVID hold, uh, which didn't quite okay because they didn't have beds at the time. Uh, but we, we know we can do that if we need to send someone to hospital as an emergency after hours. Um, and then we'll let the um, outbreak management team lead uh, and aware that we've sent someone to hospital. The other thing we've done is that uh, we've rang all the families and uh, reviewed the advanced care directives. So we know who is for resuscitation and who is not. So we've got that list uh, if required when someone is um, deteriorating, we'll be able to make that decision very quickly whether they need to be sent to hospital or not. So we've reviewed the ACDs uh, for all the residents at Gosling at this, at this stage. Thanks, Peter. And, and and you've got the contact numbers of all the GPs. You can reach out to them as required. Yes, we do. Yeah, OK. So at, at every shift in the evening, we'll have uh, a care manager dedicated to support the RNs um, with that escalation if required. So we do have that. OK, very good. Um, were there any other final questions or comments or suggestions for how to ensure that this runs smoothly in the next little while? Ivy, maybe um, could you give us the COVID care in the home phone number if you know it? If we want to call a doctor. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, think I had posted it in the chat. Oh, good. I can go back and find it. That's fine. Um, it's 0477. Nine eight seven six two five. Failing that, I'm just about to give you my phone number, which you I will know how to get someone to you. So it's oh four one nine seven eight one three four three. But if you ring that first number, that's a universal number for the medical leads, and we just divert that phone to each of our phones when we're on call, right. and it does right. work. It always works, and it's available all all hours of the day, except for between. Uh, 10 and 8, in which case I will answer the phone. <laughs> um, thanks. Okay, thanks, guys. Take care. Have a good Christmas as much as you can. I hope it, I hope it turns the corner and we have a, a much better 2022. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone, Thank you, everyone for coming. Thanks, guys. Have a good night.